Hello everyone, welcome back. It's uh, time for some more video lecturing for uh, Philosophy 115 Critical Thinking. Um, and this is a new phase of the class. So the lecture today starts us off on what is the chapter six material, but also the material that uh, is at the end after getting into the next phase here leading up to exam two. So this is after exam one, getting into exam two. So <clears throat> because of the way the schedule works out, all the more so because it's summer quarter, um, you have exam one that you're preparing for and, um, and getting ready to take over the next week. Like I've, I've given you a very generous window of time here with which to start and complete the exam. Um, and, and I wanted to do that for, to accommodate your flexibility as much as possible. Uh, the unfortunate side effect of this is that we have to plow on with more material um, to keep things moving. And so there might be some overlap here where you're working on exam one stuff, but we're going to start talking about things that have nothing to do with exam one and have everything to do with exam two. So that, that might make things a little awkward or confusing, but I want to uh, alert you to that so that you're tracking that and thinking about it. Um, it might be a reason to try to take the exam sooner and and get it in the rearview mirror so that you can have your full attentions uh, and thoughts deployed for um, this uh, next phase of the quarter. Um, your first exam is kind of like a midterm. <clears throat> the, it's the first two exams that are the doozies and the third exam like I've talked about before at the beginning of the quarter is uh, gonna land the plane down a little bit more gently. It won't be as involved and we'll see how much time we have for it too. Um, summer quarter is it's hard to just get the full quarters material packed into this tiny space um, and when I run out of time for this I, I generally accommodate that with what we do for exam three so there might be less material we'll see how it goes we'll see what we have time left for but I want to set us up for uh, shooting to have at least some time for that unit so we're going to be moving on today and getting into this this next big phase of the class which uh, if you remember me talking about kind of the structure of the quarter and what we've been working on, everything leading up to exam one has been about just listening, just developing our listening abilities to um, understand language itself. That was the chapter two stuff. But then the three and five stuff is all about just being able to understand the arguments that people are offering. And understanding is not the same as agreeing or evaluating. Those are two different things. You've got to listen first, and then maybe you can be in a position to give a critical evaluation. Well, now that we're done with the stuff leading up to this first phase, the, chap uh, the exam one stuff from chapters two, three, and five, now we can get on with the evaluation. So everything that's in this second chunk um, that's leading up to exam two is all about how to evaluate arguments. And um, if you remember back, we've already kind of alluded to this, that to have a good argument, there's really only two standards that you need. Oh, hey Neil, thanks for letting me know. I'm happy you're here. I just realized my microphone was muted on the on the chat, so sorry about that. Um, I what you, Just to catch you up here, uh, I've just been talking about um, structure of the class and how there's this overlap between you're still, you've got exam one open for a while and and at the same time, we have to move forward on material that's going to be for exam two. That's, the, that's kind of the bottom line of it. Um, and, and I was just talking about how uh, all the exam one stuff is about just listening. And now that we're getting in the stuff that's going to be relevant for exam two, uh, starting with this chapter six material on logic, um, formal logic, we're now getting into the step of evaluation. I, so can you hear me now, Neil? Probably should have asked that earlier. Am I coming through? Cool. Okay, awesome, cool. So um, thinking back here, we had two standards for what makes for a good argument. So 
So if we're thinking about evaluating an argument, what are the standards we're evaluating it by? And the criteria are, one, that the premises of the argument are all actually true, and two, that the argument has a good support relation. And when we talked about this one, the good support relation, we talked about how there's also two other standards for how to figure out if the support relation is good or not. One is the deductive standard of validity, and the other is the inductive standard of um, strength. And I've, I've got a, uh, on deck I have planned to do a, another video for the chapter three material. There are very little questions or activity on the discussion board, so I don't have much to go off of right now. But I've had some people ask me to talk about validity. And if there is a kind of overlap here between stuff we've been doing leading up to exam one and what we're starting out with here with exam two, it actually is the concept of validity. This unit that we're doing on chapter six and the next module on the Canvas site that's for chapters eight, nine, and ten altogether are really talking about deductive validity and inductive strength. That's all we're going to be doing. Um, so what, what does it look like to hold arguments accountable in their support relation to these two different standards. How do they actually work? How do they function? And how can you employ them to, to figure out if an argument is good or not? Um, there is still that other standard, though, about having actually true premises. And I have alluded to this a couple times, that evaluating that standard is a big can of worms. And it's the entire can of worms that the philosophical field of epistemology is concerned about. Epistemology is all about, like, how do we have knowledge at all, period. And while rationality is a component of that, logic is a component of that, formal and informal logic is part of that, there's a lot of other questions that need to be answered theoretically before we can figure out how to evaluate stuff like, are the premises actually true? So, there, the, and that's all very controversial territory. There are lots of different epistemic theories out there. And if you don't want to go at it in a philosophical sort of way and you just want to think about it practically, there's still lots of disagreement about that. Like, um, how should you be, um, you know, uh, evaluating sources, you know, for a research paper? Or how should you fact check news articles or stuff like that? I mean, even on the practical level, <clears throat> there's some, it's a, it's a pretty messy can of worms. Um, but... Uh, even though our class is not going to really go down that rabbit hole, um, there's a lot that we can do to be good reasoners and to evaluate reasoning based just on the standard of is the support relation a good one or not. So I, I don't really feel like you're going to have the experience over the next couple weeks of feeling like you're getting short-sold on useful curriculum <laughs> or something like that in order to be able to evaluate the arguments that you encounter on an everyday basis. I think the, it, this class will give you lots of tools in your tool belt. But <clears throat> again, there's just a lot to do, and this class is focused on some things as opposed to other things. And, and logic is mostly, whether it's formal or informal logic, um, is focused on reasoning, how we draw a conclusion based on premises. The support relation is all about that, <clears throat> and not necessarily about uh, figuring out if the premises are true or not. But uh, also rem remembering um, a kind of a callback here from previous lectures, we talked about soundness too. Soundness was all true premises plus uh, validity, having a good support relation. That's what it takes for an argument to be sound. And as we talked about before with that, <clears throat> if the argument does not have a good support relation, it doesn't even matter if the premises are true. So that's usually a good place to start. If evaluating the truth of premises is going to be a really controversial uh, mess, um, at least logic might be able to help us go at some low-hanging fruit here, like a preliminary. Is it even worth our time to explore that can of worms if we can already tell that this argument's not going to work or that it, it's insufficient support, it's bad reasoning? So that's what we're going to be doing here. Um, this unit from Chapter 6 is all about the formal standards of deductive validity, and then 8, 9, and 10 following that will all be about the uh, informal <coughs> um, inductive standards of strength. This class is not a formal logic class, 
the Bellevue, the philosophy department here at Bellevue College does offer a class just about formal logic. That's philosophy 120. Um, and this is the informal logic class, philosophy 115. Um, but I wanted to give you a little sneak preview, uh, a little taster, if you will, about formal logic and how it works. Um, because even a, a little introduction to it, I think, is valuable. And you can use it to good effect in your own life, in your own thinking. Um, but also as maybe, uh, well, this is kind of not quite what I mean, but <clears throat> as a little bit of an advertisement for Philosophy 120. I don't mean that in the terms of like trying to sell you on more philosophy classes or something, but it will let you know if that class might be interesting to you. Um, that if you're like, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this formal logic unit, and we only got the tip of the iceberg, and I want to get more of the meat. And there's some really fun stuff with logic. Uh, this will be a little bit of a change of pace from what we have been doing leading up to exam one, because uh, formal logic is completely clear cut. It is black and white. There's no gray area. It's There are rules without exceptions. And it's a lot more of like, turn the crank and spit out the answer. Um, it's kind of like doing arithmetic or algebra or something like that. So for some of you, that might be like, oh, finally. Like, I don't have to make judgment calls um, where you're always, like, second-guessing yourself. You know, you never get that absolute certainty. Um, some of you might be like, uh, yeah, this is the part that might be the scarier part. Um, <clears throat> I've always had lots of students who, and I don't really like this term, but I guess it's useful as an easy reference, but I, I've had students who are math-phobic, right, who, like, symbolic reasoning is scary and and they don't feel very good at it. Um, uh, they don't feel very very capable with it. And so doing formal logic looks scary because it looks a lot like math. I mean, we're going to be using a, a symbolic language system that we're going to learn uh, for how to analyze the formal structure of arguments. Um, but one thing I wanted to say, if you're if you are in that boat, um, I have tons of anecdotal evidence, but also there's been some great research studies in showing that taking a logic class helps students who struggle with math more than just taking more math classes. And, and I've really seen this. Like I said, I, I, I've taught, been teaching for like almost 10 years now, and I've taught plenty of formal logic classes. And I've really seen um, studying formal logic, even though it's a different system than math, and they share some symbols, but not a lot. Uh, it, it, does, it does have different rules. It's a little more intuitive. Uh, it's a way to like develop uh, your familiarity with working with a symbolic system in a way that might be a little bit more accessible than for you than math. And I've had students report back and be like, "Yeah, like that logic class kind of like opened up math for me, and it was a lot easier." Um, even though logic and math, oftentimes those classes talk about very different things. Um, so I think there's something to that, and. Um, the, the, I mean, the bottom line thing I'd want to communicate to all of you, especially those of you who um, this kind of material maybe is a little more intimidating, um, is that you can learn it. I mean, trust me on that one. Um, I've taught this material to many, many students, and I've and some students they're like, you know, totally take to it, like to a fish to water. Other students, it's more of a struggle. But I've never had a failure of a student to learn this sort of stuff. Uh, the only times where students have like bombed this logic section on exam two and never recovered were students who just never talked to me about it. Every time I worked with a student um, who like reached out and like either talked to me on the phone or met with me in person um, <clears throat> and we talked it over more and demonstrated things together, just worked on it, Every time they've been able to master it, every time. I, I, there's not a single student that worked at it, we worked on it, and we weren't able to figure it out for them. We weren't able to get them to that position of mastery. So um, that's, I hope, something that's encouraging. Um, <clears throat> oh, Neil, the video feed's getting choppy, huh? Um, here, let me pause the recording for a second. Okay, so sorry for the interruption there. Um, so I was talking about uh, just kind of a general encouragement here to um, not lose heart in trying to learn this material, even if you're really struggling with it at first. In fact, I would say there's a general experience when I teach the formal logic class where the whole quarter is all about this symbolic logic stuff. 
uh, the class definitely builds on itself, kind of like math classes do. You learn this thing, and then now you can learn this, and then you build on that, and you get these like extended abilities. Um, there's this very familiar phenomenon. I experienced it as a student, and I've definitely watched students experience it as a teacher now, where you'll be like banging your head against something one week some material, and you're just like, why is this so hard for me to grasp? Why, why am I having so much trouble with this? And then, um, you know, you'll kind of start picking it up or be able to move forward on it. And then like a week later, you look back on that stuff that you were banging your head against, and you're like, oh, this is so simple. It's so easy. Like, what was my problem? And then this week, you're banging your head against something else. So... There, there's this weird phenomenon with logic where it's, in terms of what's going on with it objectively, it's super elegant, everything connects, it just all syncs up so beautifully. There's a reason philosophers have like been enamored and infatuated with logic, because as far as theoretical systems go, it's just beautiful. It's stunning. And it's so simple. But the path towards seeing it or becoming competent with it can can get a little rocky but don't beat yourself up about it uh you're definitely not alone in this that's kind of one of the reasons i'm mentioning it. it's like i think most people have that experience with learning logic um that it's a struggle but then you know after it does make sense uh it'll it'll seem like what was my problem with this it's actually really straightforward and 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 pretty simple um it, it'll once it clicks it clicks. Um, and so some of it might be uh, before you understand what's happening, but you're overthinking things or thinking that they're more complicated than they are, which often happens. Um, but some of it's just like getting familiar with a different way of thinking. And this is where I can be really helpful. So I know almost every single video I've recorded this quarter, I've been like, contact me, call me, I'm available, I'm accessible. Especially in this unit, do that. If you're struggling, don't give up on yourself. We can definitely make this happen. Um, so I just wanted to offer that kind of encouragement. The other thing that you can do to set yourself up for success, though, is to not try to binge the logic unit. I've, I've mentioned that advice before with this class, for especially being in an online format. But with this unit in particular, the best way to learn logic is to develop it as a habit to like do a few logic problems every day. We're going to be doing these things called truth tables that require kind of a formal calculation. Um, do a few truth tables a day and get more and more practice and it will become more familiar and it will be less something mechanical where you have to always to refer back to a chart or the step-by-step -step procedure. Uh, I always tell my formal logic students when I'm teaching that 120 class like you don't want to just understand it but you want it in your bones. You want it to be a habit that this stuff is uh, so familiar you don't have to think about it. And that just takes practice. Um, so more exposure to it on a, on a more regular basis is better than trying to learn it all at once. Um, just setting aside like even just 15, 20 minutes a day to like play around in the logic waters and, and try to do some problems is I think really good. That's a lot better than a bunch of hours that's all done on one Saturday or something like that. So that I think is one of the best things you can do to set yourself up for success. But uh, be, be contacting me too, that's a, also very, very good advice. Okay, um, so I mentioned that validity is kind of a crossover here. And I'm, I might talk about this more at length in that I was saying I'm going to record a video for the Chapter 3 homework, which gets into that. Um, some, um, I think Valentin was uh, requesting that I, I go in some more in depth on that when I make that video. But I'll talk about it a little bit more right now. And I actually think learning validity in a formal process is somewhat useful for understanding it overall. Like to just help with your general understanding of the concept of validity. Because here's the deal. You got before in the lectures from chapter 3... The, and the text and all the stuff we were doing there, you got a definition for validity that is perfectly accurate and perfectly clear. And that definition was, and there's two versions, we, they mean the same thing. Um, an argument is valid if and only if 
if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. That's one way we can word it, the definition. Or we could say, an argument is valid if and only if it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false at the same time. Okay. And, I, and that's the one I kind of prefer. I think that second definition fits more closely with the practical procedure that you'll have to go through in your mind to figure out if a particular argument is valid or invalid. So um, again, the way this kind of works is if I'm given an argument, it's got premises and a conclusion, I ask myself like, can I imagine those premises true at the same time that I'm imagining the conclusion false? Do you remember my uh, example problem of um, the George Washington case? So like premise one, if George Washington was beheaded, then George Washington died. Premise two, George Washington died. Therefore, conclusion, George Washington was beheaded. That's not a valid argument because I can imagine that the conclusion is false, that George Washington was not beheaded. You know, the conclusion was he was beheaded. So if I'm imagining it false, I'm going to take the opposite of that. He was not beheaded. At the same time that I can imagine it being true that he did die, and if he had been beheaded, he would have died. Now, I can I can make that happen. I can get all the premises true and the conclusion false at the same time. I can imagine, I can conceive of a scenario in which that is true, like he died of alcohol poisoning or by aliens abducting him and throwing him out the airlock and or, you know, all these different cases. I don't know how George Washington actually died, but that would have been a counterexample too because he was not beheaded. But he still died, and if he had been beheaded, he would have died. If I can just construct a possibility like that, a conceivable scenario in which the premises are true and the conclusion false, then the argument is invalid. It's not valid. And, and this is what we've had so far to work with, is just our imagination. Can I construct that counterexample or not? If I can't construct a counterexample, we're going to say the argument is valid. Throat infection, that's how George Washington died, Neil? Did you just Google it? What a sad way to go. Huh. Oh, thanks for that. Now I learned something. Um, next time I teach this class, I'll mention a throat infection. <laughs> um, but so, so far, the, the only tool we've had at our disposal to evaluate validity has been our imagination. Can I construct a counterexample or not? Can I construct a scenario in which all the premises are true and the conclusion false or not? Um, and that's fallible. Now, if I'm able to construct a counterexample, then I know the argument is invalid. That's true. I know that with total certainty. But if I can't come up with a counterexample, I'm not yet really able to say with 100% confidence that the argument is valid. And the reason is that I might not have come up with the counterexample just because my imagination is weak. Like it's out there, I just didn't think of it. Um, so we want something a little more solid than that. And that's what motivates formal logic. All of formal logic revolves around the concept of validity and having a more systematic way to confirm that valid arguments are valid rather than just having to rely on our intuition and our fallible, finite human imagination. We want something a little bit more solid than that. And that's what you're going to see over the next couple of sessions here as I talk through the, the chapter six material. That's where this is all headed. Um, a more formal way to evaluate validity rather than this informal way of using our imaginations. Um, just since it we were asked about it, um, I can say some more things about, um, I, I, might, I might still record that video and go over, I think it was exercise six from chapter three that did that true false thing where it's like making claims about validity and you gotta figure out which claims are true and which ones are false. I might do a more extended video where I talk through those answers and why they end up working out the way that they do. But I can say a couple more things here about understanding the concept of validity. The reason why that counterexample is the way that it is, you know, when I'm testing an argument's validity, I'm looking for a case in which the premises are true and the conclusion false. The reason I'm looking for that is because I'm trying to test it. Um, I, I described in the lecture before that um, an argument that's purporting to be valid 
uh, that's trying to be valid is like trying to offer a promise or a guarantee. That the argument is basically saying, you know, for anthropomorphizing it, the argument is claiming, hey, if these premises are true, then you're going to have to endorse the conclusion. You're going to have to believe the conclusion. They prove the conclusion is true. They demonstrate the, the, the truth of the conclusion. That basically on the basis of these premises, if they're true, there's no choice but to accept the conclusion as true. There's no other option. There's no way the conclusion could be false if the premises were true. So if we're testing that promise, we have to be like, is that really the case? Is it really true that if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true and there's no other possibility out there? So we try to come up with that possibility, and if we can't, then we say it's valid. So that's what's going on there. Um, I can again reiterate and remind everyone that when it comes to validity, this is really a question of what's possible, not what's actual. So that means when you're trying to construct this counterexample, a scenario in which the premises are true and the conclusion false, you don't have to only use material that comes from the real world to fashion your counterexample, like that thing you're trying to imagine, the scenario you're trying to imagine. You could do anything, anything that doesn't involve a logical contradiction, that means it doesn't contradict itself. Um, so that means, and I've been saying, anything that's conceivable will be logically possible because you can't actually conceive of contradictions. You can't imagine something being both true and false at the same time. And if you think you can, you, there's probably something else going on there. Like uh, sometimes I use this example of you can't imagine a red car that's not red. And a student will always usually say something like, well, I can imagine that like parts of it are red, but other parts of it are not red. So it would be fair to say the car is red and not red at the same time. That's not the kind of contradiction we're talking about. Because how red's being used in one of those claims, or one part of that claim, the red car, that use of red is different than when we're saying is red. Um, so a car can't be, you, you can't have a red car that's not red. Those two instances of red have to be the same. So if I said it has a red bumper. I can't imagine the car that has a red bumper and where that bumper is also not red at the same time. This is not conceivable. If we're using red in the same sense, then that's not conceivable. If we're using it in a different sense, then all bets are off. But that's like saying, um, I can imagine uh, a car, the, the red car that's not blue. Of course, that's conceivable. Uh, Neil, you have a question? Could you evaluate this, Tim? Um, every argument, oh, this is the, the second uh, problem from that exercise. Every argument with a false premise is invalid. Your Neil's answer was false, and that's correct. Um, <laughs> you have a, kind of a silly case here. Um, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll do something that's a little less goofy than this pirate thing. Um, so here's an example. Um, and this is taken from a logic text that I use for the 120 class. Um, and, and actually here, let me pull up the, uh, well, no, I could do the whiteboard here. Okay. i do a little demonstration. Premise one. All wines are whiskey. So everything that is a wine, and I'm going to try to write this backwards so that it shows up the right way on the video. I still haven't figured out how to make Skype do what I want. Um, hey, hey, I did it. So if I'm saying all wines are whiskeys, sorry, Neil, for this, this is going to be inverted for you. Um, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Well, that, it's, yeah, I, the fact that desire shows up in your example is one of the reasons why I'm like, let's not, let's deal with something a little more straightforward than something that, that's subjective like that. That might introduce other wackiness into people's intuitions. Um, but this one's going to be like super straightforward because it's just about category relationships. So premise one says, all wines are whiskeys, which means everything that's in the wine category goes into the 
Oh my gosh. I can't do this. And maybe not spell at the same time. But it goes in the whiskey category. Okay. There we go. This is a very difficult thing to do. Am I even spelling? No. Whatever. You know what I'm saying. Whiskeys. All wines are whiskeys. That's premise one. Premise two, ginger ale is a wine. So ginger ale goes in this category of being a wine. Therefore, conclusion, ginger ale is a whiskey. Now this counterexample works great for this, this claim. It disproves that every argument with a false premise is invalid. It also disproves that every argument with a false conclusion is invalid because that argument is valid. If the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. If it's true that all wines are whiskeys and ginger ale is a wine, then ginger ale has to be a whiskey. There's no way that ginger ale could show up out here. Right? That can't happen, where ginger ale is not a whiskey. This isn't a possibility. So the argument is valid, but it has false premises and it has a false conclusion. So whether the premises and the conclusion are actually true or false doesn't have any bearing on whether the argument is valid. That's what we have this extra standard for that's like a part of soundness. Um, you want to have a good support relation, like a valid support relation. Oops, there's my microphone. And you want to have the premises actually true. Um, so, um, does that help you, Neil? Is that making sense? All on the internet connection. All wines are whiskeys, and ginger ale is a wine. Therefore, ginger ale is a whiskey. That's right. Yep. Just if the premises were true, can I conceptually get the conclusion false? And in this case, I can't. Well, like, um, well, th th we, t we talked about, like, hypothetical states of affairs before with conditionals, and I think conditionals are helpful to get in touch with the relevant intuitions here. So, for example, um, we talk about possibilities in a way that's relevant for understanding our world, even if they're not currently happening. Like when I said before, it's true that if my head is cut off, I will die. But my head's not cut off. I'm not dead, right? But we'd say that hypothetical situation holds. If my head was cut off, then I'd be dead. Validity is saying if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. So what if the premises were true? Would that force the truth of the conclusion? What if my head was cut off? Would that cause me to die? Is that helping? Yes, that's right. And and that's kind of why we call them premises. Like we use the word premise to discuss like uh, the, say, hypothetical scenario that a plot for a movie or a book is written on. Like, say, it's like science fiction. What if robots took over the world and put us all into computer simulations? That's the premise of the Matrix, right? Um, so a premise for an argument is like, Hey, if this stuff is true, then we can draw a conclusion based off of that. And we're saying something more. Not just that if the premises are true, the conclusion will be true. Also, the premises are true, therefore the conclusion is true. 
That's what arguments are trying to do. They have those two components. If the premises are true, the conclusion follows from that. And the premises are true, so therefore the conclusion is true. Good. Any other kind of questions? I'm happy that you're here so I can bounce off my attempts at explanation on a human and see how it's going. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so I might, I might go over more of those uh, problems about validity, but it's worth recapping because, like I said, everything we're going to be doing in this Chapter 6 material, all about validity. Validity is the thing that's the shadow of under everything we're going to be doing in logic. Um, it's an, it's, logic is really an attempt to understand validity and to be able to determine which arguments are valid and which ones are not valid. That's what it's been created for. Um, so after we do chapter six, then we'll go back into um, induction and informal logic and we'll do uh, inductive strength. But right now we're, we're going to focus on, on uh, deductive validity. And for the, the main part of my lecture today, of, I've been doing all this kind of setup for the last half hour. Where I want to go next is still kind of set up. Before we dive into the nitty gritty details, what I want to do next here is give you a broad overview of everything we're going to be doing in this unit. Everything that we're trying to understand about formal logic, I want to kind of give you a nutshell version of so that uh, it won't be as scary. You'll kind of know where we're going to be going and how far we're going to be going. Um, and then after that, we can start getting into the nitty gritty details. Um, uh, I'll be introducing the formal system, the, the language of formal logic that we'll be operating with, the symbolic language. Uh, you'll get that today. And you'll see, I've, hopefully you'll be able to get a vision for um, sort of what this whole logic game is, like why we're doing it and how it works. The details might still be fuzzy or you're like, why is this going on? Um, but you'll get the broad principles of it. That, that's what I'm hoping for for the rest of the lecture today. And I'll be working on a kind of whiteboard um, online here. So Neil, uh, I'm going to try to replicate it on the whiteboard here so that you can also see what's happening. Um, and it won't be backwards for you, um, but I'll be p doing Microsoft Paint again for everyone who's watching this on YouTube later. Um, but I'm going to use a toy example here, um, and uh, actually, actually, I mean that literally, pun intended, because um, we're going to talk about Clue, the board game Clue. I'm going to use this as a setting. Neil, have you played Clue before? Yes. Uh, okay, cool. Um, so I've pulled up here for everyone who's seeing my screen capture uh, a photo from Google Photos about just the board game. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it the broad explanation here. So if you haven't played the game before and you're watching this later, you know what I'm talking about. Um, the, the board game of Clue is a deduction game. The premise for it is that there's a murder in a mansion and there have been a bunch of guests invited over and you're trying to figure out who was the murderer, what weapon they used, and which room in the mansion the murder occurred in. And you can see in the picture here there are cards, and these cards represent all these things. This picture is kind of grainy, but here's a picture of, this looks like Professor Plum, who's one of the suspects. This card is the rope, which is one of the murder weapons. And here, maybe that's the billiard room. Yeah, one of the rooms. So at the beginning of the game, you shuffle up each of the categories of cards, and then secretly, without looking at it, without anybody looking at it, you take one suspect card, one weapon card, and one room card, and then you put them in this little envelope here and hide it away. Then you take all the other cards, without looking at them, shuffle them up, and then deal them out to the other players. So at the beginning of the game, and you got this little pad of paper to keep track of everything, at the beginning of the game, you have some initial information. Any of the cards that are in your hand are cards that couldn't be in that secret envelope that has the actual solution to the crime. So you can weed things out. So if I was dealt Professor Plum, I'm going to X him off my list of murder suspects because it can't be him. I, I'm holding the card. It's not in the envelope, right? 
Um, and over the course of the game, you get to there's a there are rules of how you get to do things, but you get to make guesses and um, and see cards from other people's hands. So I, I won't go through all the details here, but you over the course of the game, you get to see the cards other people have, and not just the cards that you have. And you kind of get to see what other people are asking questions about too, and you can do some inductive reasoning there. I won't get into that, but let's just play the game the way I played it, or think about playing the game the way I played it when I was like, say, six, five or six or something. Because at that point, uh, as a child, I was not intelligent enough to do anything other than just brute deduction, just basic process of elimination. So for the example argument that I want to talk about, which I put here on the whiteboard, and I'll, I'll draw it up here for you, Neil, so you can see it. What am I working on here? Okay, so can you see this, Neil? Okay, cool. So I'll read as I'm writing. Either Miss Scarlet, who's one of the suspects here, or Colonel Mustard is the murderer. So we're imagining I've been playing this game for a little while, and I, I've seen enough cards that I've narrowed it down to these two. And then I, I take my next turn, and you hand me a card, and I secretly take a look at it, and then I pass it back to you, and it's Colonel Mustard. So now I learned something else. Colonel Mustard is not the murderer. Now I'm in a position to make a deduction. What can I conclude? Neil, I bet you can figure this one out. Yep, exactly right. Therefore, Miss Scarlet is the murderer. <laughs> well, we don't have that input. That wouldn't be a valid deduction. Um, but uh, here, what, I don't want to. It. Does this work? You can still kind of read it. Yeah. I mean, it's a fairly simple argument. But um, here's an argument kind of with the analysis that we've done so far with all the stuff up to Chapter 5. If I wanted to diagram it, it wouldn't be hard to diagram. 2 plus 3 allows me to infer 1. So I've got it in standard form, and I've got a diagram to understand its structure. Um, and, but this is all still in English. And we could try to evaluate this argument's validity um, using our intuition and our imagination. Like when I just asked you, Neil, what's the conclusion we can draw from this? You had no problem giving the answer. So again, um, this is a case uh, of this phenomenon that's shown up in the class before where you don't need to take this class to like be a somewhat competent thinker or reasoner. Like, you have rational capacities, even if you don't know everything formally. But in simple situations where we're pretty reliable, uh, in other situations that start to get more complicated or involve other logical forms of claims, especially conditionals, because we're so bad at, at conditionals intuitively, uh, then we can get confused and we can make illogical conclusions. Um, we can make arguments that are not valid, but which we think look good, or just generally misunderstand what's happening here. So it'd be useful to be able to break down, almost like a science, uh, what's happening. What's happening with these rational inferences? When are they valid? When are they not valid? In a way that's more pinned down. We want to take that implicit understanding that we have intuitively and make it explicit and be able to represent it in a way we can communicate with other people about it, the way we can compare notes. It's not just our gut reactions to things of like, yeah, that makes sense to me. That's a little flimsy. We want something more solid. And that's why we're going to develop a, a logical language for being able to express this um, and demonstrate that this argument is valid in a way that we can have 100% confidence about. 
Um, that's what we're going to do. So I know this is this looks like a really simple case, but I chose it for that reason to like demonstrate what's going on with logic in a way that's not confusing, um, or at least as simple as possible to get started, and then we'll be able to make it more complicated as we keep going. But if we are going to use the first method we have for evaluating validity, that's the imagination method. That's what you've been doing with the homework assignments up to this point before the chapter six stuff. Um, we just have to rely on our imagination. And can I imagine these premises both coming out true and the conclusion false? You know, can I imagine this counterexample combo? Let me put it on here in the uh, whiteboard I've got on Microsoft Paint. Can I imagine this true, this true, and this false? Is that possible? If it is, here I'm gonna, there we go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually kind of spell this out super literally because it's also helpful for just understanding. Um, validity here because people have been asking about that. Um, if, oh I don't, let, that's silly, let's not do that. If I can imagine this, if the answer to is there a counterexample, if that's yes, then that's going to mean something. And if it's no, it's going to mean something else. So let me actually, I'll draw this for you, um, Neil, on the board in a second here. It just takes a little while to do things in Microsoft Paint. Uh, oops. There we go. All right. So I asked myself, can I imagine this counterexample? And if the answer is yes versus no, that's going to mean something for validity. So here's yes, here's no. If the answer is yes, then that means the argument is invalid. The presence of this counterexample proves that the premises being true does not guarantee the truth of the conclusion. So that's why if I can imagine this, that the answer to that is yes, then we say it's invalid. If the answer is no, then we say it's valid. Okay, there is no counterexample, so it's actually valid. You know, the argument is able to deliver on its promise that if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. There's no other option. And if I use my imagination here with this problem, I'm looking at it, I'm like, can I imagine the conclusion false, Miss Scarlet is not the murderer, and yet both of these things are true? And I'm like, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. That's like the pen cap example. Pen cap's in my left hand and my right hand. If it's not in my left hand, it's got to be in my right hand. What other option is there? There isn't one. This argument is process of elimination, or as we call it in logic, disjunctive syllogism. I'm not going to use too many of those fancy words, so don't worry. And that you don't have to know those things. Um, if you take more logic, you will. If you take 120, you'll want to have those down like the back of your hand. But we're not going to go that far in, in our little crash course here. Um, but I, I'm using my imagination here, and I'm like, yeah, I'm not able to come up with a counterexample. But I might, be, I might still have some paranoid doubt. Like, am I just like not being creative enough with my imagination? Or like, how, what could I say to somebody else for like, here's why a counterexample is in principle impossible? Like, how could I prove that? That's kind of tricky. This is where formal logic is going to be helpful to us. Um, and the way we're going to be able to get to a point to be able to analyze the structure of this argument to see that it's valid will require us to drain away. I'm using a kind of Kantian metaphor. Immanuel Kant uh, is a really famous philosopher. And he actually has his own weird way to teach logic. Uh, but and it's, it's not the way I generally teach logic, but he has certain turns of phrases that are really useful um, that I think help with understanding. And for Kant, he makes a big deal about the content of our claims versus their form, content versus form. 
And logic is about, is really, a, whether arguments are valid or not, is a function of their form and not usually their content. So we're going to drain out all the content and just turn it into empty letters to be able to see how a form of reasoning is a good form of reasoning, good form of argumentation. And the reason, the sort of inspiring idea here is, take a look at this argument again. What if I substitute all the instances of Miss Scarlet with somebody else? What if instead of Miss Scarlet, we replace it with Mr. Green or Miss Peacock or something like that? This argument would still sound just as good. Or, what if we swapped out this predicate, is the murderer, is the murderer, is the murderer, with something like, is a banana lover, or loves Nicolas Cage movies, or whatever you want, um, knows how to skydive, or really anything, has been to the moon. Any, if we swap out the content, the conceptual content of what we're talking about in a consistent way, the argument sounds just as good. It's, it seems just as valid. And that's a clue. It doesn't prove anything on its own, but it's a clue that maybe what makes this argument valid does not have to do with its content of what it's talking about, but has more to do with um, the form of it. You can kind of imagine this as like, and, and this happens all the time. Uh, actually, here, on the... <laughs> on the Google images where I, I did a Google search to find a version of Clue, here's a Game of Thrones version. And what did they do? They just replaced the characters from the original Clue game with characters from Game of Thrones. And that doesn't change the way the game is played at all. It's not like, oh, now that we're talking about Daenerys, now I, I have to approach my strategy for the game in a different way. No. I played the game the exact same way. They just pasted on a different theme pretty much things are, uh, they, they're not functionally any different. Now, I don't know what, uh, when uh, Hasbro or Milton Bradley, I don't know who owns Clue anymore, when they decided to make the Game of Thrones version, maybe they added some rules or something. But let's say they didn't. You know, they just have the same game, but they changed the cards. Instead of Miss Peacock, it's, um, I don't know, like Jon Snow or something, right? They just swap them out. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the image on the card is, the card functions the same way in the game. And this idea of truth as a function is something I'm going to talk about a lot with logic. Truth functional expressions is a fancy phrase here that we'll be cashing out. But this is a clue that maybe whether this argument is valid or not really doesn't have anything to do with its content, but it has everything to do with its form. So how are we going to go about draining away all the content so that we can see the form well, we're going to invent a special language for this, a symbolic language. And the one we're going to learn is something called propositional logic. And it, there's other uh, bells and whistles that we'll throw onto this symbol language to be able to express more aspects of logic. Predicate logic uh, is the next evolution of propositional logic. If you took a 120 class, you definitely get to predicate logic. There's also modal logic, which I mentioned before, uh, which is... Uh, it introduces uh, mechanisms into the language to accommodate claims about what's possible versus what's necessary, all this kind of stuff. So there's some bells and whistles, but the core is propositional logic, and so that's what we're going to be starting with. Um, I'll, you'll get a little introduction to that here today um, and in the coming week. Uh, so what, I'll, I'll talk about the next stage of the lecture here is breaking down the components of that logical symbol language and how we translate things from English into the symbol language and then what we can do with that, how we can use the symbolic version translation of this argument to, um, to analyze the argument for validity. So that's where this is all going. Um, I think this is a good time to take a break, uh, Neil. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little short break. Uh, get some water and um, or get something to drink, and I'll be back in a few minutes, maybe like 10, 15 minutes. Sound good? Okay. See you in a little bit, YouTube. All right. So getting back into it here. 
Um, as I mentioned right before we took the break, the next step here is going to be learning the symbolic language and how we can translate things from English into the symbolic language and then analyze the result. And there's going to be rules for all of this. And I, I said earlier that this chapter six unit on formal logic is maybe going to be like a breath of fresh air because it's going to be all black and white and clear cut and follow the rules and turn the crank and it's not all these like subjective judgment calls. And for the most part that is true when it comes to the logical language. The unfortunate thing is that English doesn't work this way. Like the, the, the symbolic language of propositional logic is perfectly exact. Yeah, we call it discrete. There's no weird fuzzy edges to it or ambiguities or conversational implication opportunities or stuff like that. There's nothing like that happening. But English has that. So if we're trying to capture the meaning of what's going on in English and put it into formal logic, there will be some judgment calls, but that's all because of the English part, not because of the formal logic part. And actually, the way I'm going to be ultimately lecturing on this material after we get through this like broad overview today, what you're going to see in my next video um, next week, is going to be, or maybe I'll do one this weekend. I still have to figure that out. But the next video, whenever that is, um, I'm actually going to start with the symbol language first. And figuring out how to get things from English into the symbol language will be the last thing I lecture on. The book does it the other way, where it's like, uh, talks about the translations first and then how you can analyze what happens in logic later. And I think that this is not the best way to teach it, from my experience, because it's kind of like learning a foreign language through a phrase book. Um, you can take a phrase book to maybe a foreign country or something that speaks a language you don't know and get around, like you can figure out how to ask where the bathroom is or... I'd like a coffee, please, or something like that, using your phrase book. But if you ever want to say anything novel, you are helpless. Right? You just know this phrase has this meaning, and your, your vocabulary is very limited here this way. You only can work with the prepackaged sentences that the phrase book gives you to work with. And I think the way that the book is sort of initially introducing you to all this is basically giving you a phrase book. When you see these words and phrases, they mean this logical symbol. And what I'm going to tr strive to do is teach you the meaning of the logical language on its own independently. And then, if, you, if you're in a position where you are able to understand logic on its own terms, now you're going to be able to make the judgment calls of how to get English into that language. Um, you need to know the semantic and syntactic conventions of the logical symbol language to know how to match it with what meanings we're getting from English. So you will see a little bit of a backwards uh, approach for how I'm going to lecture based on the approach the book is taking, uh, the sequence of how it presents material, but we're going to cover the same ground. And, and I am going to be in walking you through this demonstration, kind of following the book's thing. But once we get into the nitty-gritty details after that, we'll, we'll spend all our time with logic. And I'll, I'll allude maybe to some of that stuff about how the logical language operates uh, even in this introduction today. All right, let's get into it. So um, going back to the whiteboard here, um, I'm just going to delete this right now to make some room. So we, we made the observation earlier that if I start swapping out different aspects of these claims, like every time I see Miss Scarlet, I replace it with something, or every time we have the is the murderer idea, we replace it with something consistently, we're going to get the same kind of argument. And that's this clue about how there's, a, there's a, something formal happening here, and the content is not as much what matters. In order to drain out the content from these claims so that we're just left with their form, we're going to need to do something... That this the, the book doesn't talk a ton about this, but and it's not um, a huge thing for the exam, which I'll explain in a little bit why. But what we're going to need here is a oops, a universe of discourse. And this is going to introduce us to the first component of our logical symbol language, and those are letters. So I'm going to down here. Uh, let's say. Um, components to 
proposition propositional logic and one component are propositional letters P Q R and so on oops dang it so what these propositional letters stand for are simple propositions or simple claims as opposed to um, complex claims. Uh, Neil, did you ever uh, know uh, Schoolhouse Rock? Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Yeah. Yep. That, that's all about like um, something grammatical. That in English we can take simple sentences and combine them to make complex sentences. I can say something and then put an and in there. Um, I can say something and something else. And now I've got a more, it's one sentence, but it's got more ideas in it. We've already remarked before how a single sentence of argumentative prose could have multiple claims inside of it that are being combined grammatically. Well, the same kind of thing happens in logic, that I can take a really simple claim, a proposition, and combine it with other simple claims to make more complex propositions. But the simple claims the simple propositions will be representing with simple letters. So this is just a subject predicate combo. So uh, a discrete state of affairs. And I'll do a demonstration here. So in the argument that we've got, we have some complex claims. We also have a simple claim, and that's claim number one. Miss Scarlet is the murderer. There's no structure of this. Uh, it's just a straightforward, here's a subject, Miss Scarlet, with a predicate is the murderer. And we're going to represent those simple propositions with letters. So let's do, let's have S. F, S is going to stand for the simple proposition, Miss Scarlet is the murderer. There we go. And you'll notice that uh, this uh, simple proposition doesn't just show up in the conclusion, claim one. It also shows up in claim three, but there's more going on in claim three, right? It's not just Miss Scarlet is the murderer. That claim, uh, that premise is also talking about the proposition in which Colonel Mustard is the murderer. Now it's doing so in an either or framework, and we'll get to that in a second here, but um, Miss Scarlet or Colonel Mustard being the murderer is talking about these simple propositions. Miss Scarlet is the murderer, and we'll make another one here. C. C will stand for Colonel Mustard is the murderer. Okay, so the, the, the universe of discourse kind of is like the key that helps us understand what symbols we're going to end up having in our translation. Um, the translation from English into propositional logic will still have the same basic structure. We're going to have uh, a symbolic representation of every single claim that showed up in the original argument. So there's going to be claim one down here, there's going to be claim two up here, and claim three up here. So uh, I'm going to use propositional letters to represent this. So we could already translate the claim, Miss Scarlet is the murderer. If S just stands for Miss Scarlet is the murderer, all we got to put down here is S. Boom. Translation achieved. So far, so good, Neil? This making sense so far, Neil? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right, but now we've got some more complex stuff going on. Um, premise two says Colonel Mustard is not the murderer. You might have wondered why in the universe of discourse I said C, Colonel Mustard, is the murderer. Well, to throw the not in there is actually introducing some complexity to the formal structure of the claim. The root proposition is just Colonel Mustard is the murderer. To throw the not is to just deny that. It's kind of like saying it's not the case that 
Colonel Mustard is the murderer. And we have a symbol to represent that. Also, in claim three here, we know that this claim is talking about the simple ideas of Miss Scarlet being the murderer, Colonel Mustard being the murderer, but it's combining them together to make a complex claim with this idea of either or. And we're going to have a symbol for that kind of combination. And what we're going to refer to as these symbols that build complex propositions out of simple propositions, we're going to call these logical operators. And there's a few of them. Uh, there's only five that we have to learn. So there's not a ton. But there's and, there's or, there's if then, there's if and only if, and then there's not. And I have to actually change these symbols a little bit to draw them properly. Um, I'm going to do here, the if and only if needs to have another line here. So I'm going to, oh gosh, that looks terrible. Let's do a little thicker. Uh, there we go. There we go. So that's a triple bar, three lines here. This carrot that's sideways should look like a horseshoe. In fact, let me just draw it right <laughs> instead of making it confusing here. Um, the conditional, the if then, will look something like. Let's see if I can draw it nice. It'll, it should look like that, roughly. <laughs> Um, okay, so these logical operators always take other things, other like propositional letters or other logical expressions, and combine them together. So for example, here I'll just do a little demonstration. If we've got an and in here, um, it's always going to take uh, some blah and combine it with another blah. That's it. So I can't say P and Q and R. That makes no sense. That's a syntax error. Uh, it's always got to be two things that are being combined. So P and Q, that would work OK. P and, nope, that makes no sense. Syntax error. Each of these, uh, uh, the operators, the first four operators, all have this structure. There's always two things that they're kind of gluing together. Um, different from this, the only one that doesn't play by this pattern is the negation. A negation just modifies some blah. It says not that. It's not the case that blah. And I'm going to use this blah thing all the time here because the there's going to be more elaborate chunks of things that we can combine using logical operators. Like once we start introducing some complexity, we can keep building more complexity from there. And being able to see parts of a logical expression as just a chunk of something that's being connected with another chunk of something via a logical operator is going to be a very important visual skill that you're going to want to get good with. And you'll see, uh, uh, we'll get some demonstrations of this pretty soon. Maybe not in today's lecture, but, but, but soon. So if I know the negation works like this, I can take a blah and then just say not that. Now we know how to deal with premise two. Colonel Mustard is not the murderer. If C stands for Colonel Mustard is the murderer, then we just have to deny that. Not C. There we go. And now we've captured the idea of claim two from English into our logical symbol language. Again, Neil, so far so good? This is all right? Okay. Oh, man, I'm so sorry for you about the, this internet connection. It's so annoying. Um, if, it's, if it's getting in the way, don't, don't hesitate to, to let me know, and I can pause the video. Okay. Okay. So um, now we've got premise three here. We've got to get claim three still translated. And this one was saying either Miss Scarlet or Colonel Mustard is the murderer. There are these two possibilities. This is what we have the logical operator or for. 
and that's we we represent that with this little wedge. So again, we're going to have some blah over here and some blah over here. And in this case, the two blahs are just these two simple propositions. Miss Scarlet is the murderer or Colonel Mustard is the murderer. At least one of these two things is the case. And we're going to represent that as C wedge or S wedge C. There we go. That's all we have to do. It's that simple. So what we're seeing here, if we're just looking at it from the, the, the propositional logic symbolic language side of things, is now we've been able to drain away all the particular conceptual content of these premises and just look at it as something or something else. Not that second thing, therefore the first one is true. And this is the form of process of elimination or disjunctive syllogism. You can see how this form works exactly the same with the pen cap argument. S could be standing for the pen is in my left hand. C could stand for the pen is in my right hand. If I also know the pen is not in my right hand, then I can conclude that the pen is in the left hand. So what we've been able to do is see this form of reasoning that's not committed to any particular subject matter. And if we can show that this form of reasoning is valid, then that's really cool and powerful. Because it means any time I see that form of reasoning, I'll know it's a good argument, at least in terms of the support relation. Now, the, whether the premises are true or not, that's a whole other matter. And logic is not going to help us with that. Logic can't tell you what's true. It can only tell you what's possible, and thus it's capable of letting us know about what is valid. What is valid reasoning. So we've accomplished step one. Let's call that, let's make this explicit. Step number one of our logical analysis is to translate an argument from English in standard form into propositional logic. And we've, we've just accomplished that. Now sometimes these translations get a little more complicated. So there is one more component to our propositional logic symbolic language that we want to define, and those are parentheses. So we're going to have parentheses in here too. So things like this, or brackets, or these kind of brackets, um, we'll use these too. And the reason is that if each of these operators is either gluing together two things, or in the case of the negation, just modifying one thing, if we want to say anything more complicated, we're going to be able to, we need to show which chunks are being held together with which operators. I'm going to just give you a, an example, and this might look scary at first, but this is one you'll get very familiar with because it's going to help us understand either or uh, statements a lot better. So you're seeing this on the screen, Neil? That's if and only if. And um, if and only if, we, we used it before. I used it to define validity, right? An argument is valid if and only if the premises being true guarantees the truth of the conclusion. Or if and only if it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false at the same time. So actually, I've got some Word documents with notes up on this material. that They're up on Canvas. Um, you can find them. Um, and I've got those symbols there in those documents, so you can just copy and paste them. Because, yeah, digging through the symbol function is annoying <laughs> on Microsoft Word. So, um, I, I act And actually, on the exam, I'm going to give you the symbols there so you can just copy and paste them when you're putting your answers together. You don't have to hunt around to find them. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, oh, I'll, I meant to bring this up. I forgot to mention it. So 
I mentioned how the universe of discourse is not something you're, I want you to worry about too much for this unit. And that's because on the exam, when you're having to do translations, I will give you a universe of discourse. You're not going to have to come up with it out of thin air. So I, I wanted to just take that off your plate so that you can focus more on listening for which logical operators are appropriate for capturing the, the shape of the claims being offered. So there won't be some guessing game about whether you have c constructed the right universe of discourse or not. But what we're basically doing is trying to pick out all the simple propositions that the complex propositions are built out of. So that's what that's about. Okay, but I've got this new one here. I've got this new uh, logical expression. And this one would read like P or Q, but not both. So one or the other, but not both. This wedge is a very non-committal wedge. So the wedge for the or, is, uh, the technical name for this is the disjunction. And disjunctions are either or statements. Um, they're talking about a range of possibilities. But uh, disjunctions come in two flavors. There are inclusive and exclusive disjunctions. And, and don't worry about memorizing this right now or getting it. We're going to talk about it a lot in the next lecture. Um, but all English use of either or or the other kinds of words and phrases that communicate a range of possibilities, like the word unless, for example, they're all ambiguous about whether they mean um, one or the other but not both. That's the exclusive meaning. Or at least one of these two things is true. That's the inclusive meaning. And logic is more precise in English, so we define this very clearly. And the, uh, the little wedge refers to the inclusive or. So if we wanted to express this extra meaning that they can't both be true, so it's one or the other, we would put this but not both part in. But what I want you to, to kind of see in this symbolic expression is that the parentheses are being used to sort of chunk up different selections of symbols. So this P wedge Q part is one of the blahs that this and, this ampersand, is gluing together with this other blah over here. And this other blah is complicated too. The negation is modifying this entire parenthetical like this. You can kind of visualize this parenthetical as a chunk that's then getting negated. Just like down here, you've got not blah, right? And then this wedge here, this ampersand here, they're gluing together the simple propositions. So this is an early introduction to how once we start using logical operators to make more complex expressions, we can keep doing it. In fact, if I really wanted to, I could put brackets around this whole thing and now start combining it with logical operators with other things. We could throw a conditional in here and have some other blah over here. Or I could slap a negation in front of all of this thing that's being bracketed. I mean, there can be much more complex structures to logical expressions. And the big thing I want to tell you right now, if anyone's starting to feel a little nervous about it, one thing you can trust going forward as we learn this material is that no matter how complicated the logical expressions get, they're always just very simple things that are happening just repeatedly. So you're never going to be asked to somehow, to be a good logician, to be able to work with logic in a, in a competent way, you never need to be able to intuit the whole thing. You don't need to like stretch your imagination to somehow be able to grab the whole expression and, and imagine in your mind conceptually what it means. People who are like trained logicians, like I, I'm a, I have a philosophy degree, so I have some logic training, but I'm not a specialist in logic. Um, but even the ones who are specialists in logic, their intuition runs out. I mean, they, they have a better intuitive grasp of logic than I do because they're working with it all the time. <clears throat> and things look familiar to them, uh, kind of like when you take a math class and you work on something enough, it starts to look familiar. But even their intuitions stop at a certain point, and they can't just do it in their head. 
And to calculate logic is really just a bunch of simple steps that you may just have to do a lot of them. But don't try to do them all at once or something like that. If, you, if, you're, if you're using that kind of strategy or it's feeling like that while you're working on logic problems, then that's not how you have to do it. You're making it harder on yourself than it has to be. Um, but we're going to break things down piece by piece. And you'll see a little bit of this in the remaining lecture today, but you'll see a lot of that happening, demonstrated for you in the uh, next lecture. But let's, let's, uh, let's shy away from this um, for one second, because the one or the other but not both thing is probably the right way to translate the premise claim number three. So what we've got right here, let me just get rid of all that junk. This right here, if we were to use the proper um, letters from the universe of discourse, three should probably look like S or C, but not S and C. And the reason for this is that um, in the rules of Clue, only one suspect card goes into the envelope. That's usually an assumption we could make about the context. Um, but, you know, actually, Maybe that's not an assumption we should make. Um, I'm actually remembering a time I played, I can't remember, I, I just, this memory just popped into my head. Um, I remember playing with a game of Clue with my cousins when I was a kid at my grandmother's house. And she had a really old copy of the game. And I remember us playing the game, and then we were like, what is the answer? We've been playing this game forever, and no one's figured it out. And what happened was when we put a card into that secret envelope, it was stuck to another card. So there were two cards. I don't think it was suspects. It might have been something else. I don't remember what it was. But there were two cards that were stuck in the envelope. So one of those three variables of suspect, murder weapon, or location was doubled up. So logically speaking, in terms of imagining all the possible things that could have happened here, I guess even with the rules of Clue, we might not be playing it the right way. If I'm trying to figure out like what's in that envelope, Maybe Miss Scarlet and Colonel Mustard, those cards are both in that envelope. That, I mean, that could happen. So, uh, but for just simplicity's sake here, we're going to stick with the, the more simple inclusive disjunction wedge symbol here instead of this more complicated expression here. So I'm just kind of simplifying it for the ease of this demonstration. But we'll be very sensitive to when we see either or in English, we, we won't know, should we translate it like this, inclusive, or should we translate it like this, exclusive? Um, and I'll show you a lot more about that in the next lecture. Okay. Um, before any go, I go any further, um, Neil, do you have any questions you want to ask? Before we go in the, the final stretch here. Wonderful. So happy to hear it. Okay. All right. So what's step number two? Step number two is setting up our evaluation of the argument for validity purposes. And to do that, we're going to do something called, we're going to make something called a truth table. And truth tables are really interesting. By the way, if you're a person who likes puzzles, if you like to do puzzles, I strongly recommend taking a formal logic class. Like you like Sudoku or other kinds of like logic puzzles. Um, a logic class can be a heck of a lot of fun uh, just as like giving you little brain teasers to, to work with. And a lot of the stuff we're going to be doing in our class is, uh, oops, that's not what I want, is going to be, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, mechanical calculations. But when you go on and do more work in logic, you end up uh, having to use a lot of like creative strategizing to be able to um, solve proofs and stuff like that. That's going to go a little further than what we have plans to accomplish in our our crash course treatment. But um, if you ever want to just hear from me about what the rest of logic looks like, <clears throat> I'd be happy to give you a sneak preview of other stuff that we'll be doing that you, you would do if you were taking, say, 
a um, 120 class. All right, so <clears throat> right now what I'm doing is drawing up a truth table. And a truth table is a funny object. I'm going to try to explain some of the meaning here today. Um, but the basic idea is this. I've drawn a circle. This circle represents all the logical possibilities, all the different ways the world could be. When Remember when we're evaluating validity, it's a matter of what's possible. And I told you that the, the operative concept of possibility that we use for validity is logical possibility, which means that the only thing that's constraining what's logically possible versus what's logically impossible is the principle of non-contradiction or the law of excluded middle, whatever you want to call it. So the boundary here for um, the boundary for this circle is just defined by the principle of non-contradiction. As long as something the, the, a thought of something doesn't contradict itself, it's logically possible. So that means all sorts of wacky stuff is logical po logically possible even if it doesn't play by the laws of nature, even if it's implausible or improbable or something like that. It gets in this circle. So if we have to cover the entire ground of all of these different logically possible worlds and the alternate facts that could be present in them, all these different scenarios, in trying to figure out if an argument is valid or not, that's a lot of ground to cover. And our imagination doesn't cover all of it. Maybe we cover some parts of it in a goofy pattern here, but it's not an exhaustive analysis. And what we really like is an exhaustive analysis. How can we accomplish that? Well, there's a way. Thanks to using the principle of non-contradiction itself. Let me show you what I mean. In this entire space of possible worlds, given that contradictions can't happen, I know that with respect to any single proposition, any possible world will be in one of two categories. The principle of non-contradiction says all claims are either true or false. Those are the only two options. So if I'm thinking about this proposition, Miss Scarlet is the murderer, I can divide all this possible world space into worlds in which that's a true statement and worlds in which that's not a true statement. So for every possible world, it's either a world in which Miss Scarlet is the murderer or a world in which she's not the murderer. It's not true that she's the murderer. In that one stroke, whoop, that line I drew right there, we've covered all the possibilities. Those are the only two things that could happen. So I'm going to diagram this in my truth table. S could be true or S could be false. Each one of these lines, um, each one of the rows here of the truth table is going to, oh, come on. There we go. Each one of these rows is going to be a different possible scenario or set of possibilities. And we want to cover this ground exhaustively. And we're, we're able to do that. I don't need to know all the other facts. I don't need to be able to imagine all the other things that are going on here to know that for any possibility, it's either in this category or it's in this category. And if I can do this once, I can do it twice. Boom. Now I can divide it up into worlds in which Colonel Mustard is the murderer and worlds in which it's not the case that he's the murderer. If I wanted to throw another proposition in here, I would have to start getting into a sphere that I'm sectioning up like orange slices into eight quadrants. And if I want to go to four, I can do that. I have to start using multi-dimensional or extra-dimensional geometry to represent it, but there's nothing that's stopping us from doing so, um, theoretically. Um, we actually, I mean, you can find YouTube videos are pretty cool of uh, computer programs that are able to give geometrical representations of multi uh, extra dimensional spaces in a two or three dimensional model. Um, it's pretty goofy. Um, but you, you get the idea that 
we're basically trying to integrate, or I hope you're getting the idea, we're trying to cross-index these different possibilities with each other. So if I have two propositional letters here, C and S, and either one of them, there are only two possibilities, it's either true or false, then if I wanted to look at all the different possible combinations, I've got four. So I'm going to set that up in my truth table to represent all four quadrants. There's this possibility in which S and C are both true, where Colonel Mustard and Miss Scarlet did it together, where the cards were stuck together and they both ended up in the envelope. Or another possibility is Miss Scarlet is a murderer, but Colonel Mustard is not. So Colonel Mustard's card is not in the envelope, but Miss Scarlet's is. There's also the possibility where Miss Scarlet's card is not in the envelope. She's not the murderer, but Colonel Mustard's is. And the last possibility is the one in which we misdealed and never got either one of their cards into the envelope. Maybe they were left in the box or something. So we've got four different possibilities here. Four uh, really sets of possibilities for how this could all turn out. And this is where we're getting into our next big idea of logic. Namely, that the truth of logical expressions is dependent on the truth of their component parts. I mentioned we were going to talk about how logic is uh, this phrase of something being a truth functional expression. So I'm going to look at all the claims that, are, that showed up in the argument here that we're trying to analyze. We had S or C, that's one of them. We also have not C, and then we have S. I'm going to make a different column for each of these. And what the truth table is basically going to be representing as information here is under all the different possibilities, we've, we've covered all of our bases here, all the different possible uh, worlds that could be relevant to evaluating these claims. We've covered all of our bases here. Uh, the first line represents this quadrant. The second line represents this quadrant. Uh, the third one represents this quadrant, and the fourth one is here. In fact, let me just make that explicit for you. One, two, three, and four. That, that corresponds with one, two, three, four here, going down. So if I made the statement, Miss Scarlet or Colonel Mustard is the murderer, and the world's conditions were set up like this, I would be saying a true statement here. And the reason is that we're, you know, for our simplification purposes, we're treating this or statement as at least one of these two things is true. And that's happening. I mean, think of what's happening over here as the, like, the conditions or the facts, if you will. Um, they're possible... Whoa possible conditions, um, their states of affairs, or maybe facts um, in a world. So this is, all of this is referring to what's happening right here, before I put this double bar here. These are, I'm just setting up all the possibilities. <clears throat> These are kind of like the inputs that then we're going to generate outputs uh, when we throw these inputs into this logical pattern, we get this output. And, and actually, this is maybe a good time for me to mention this. Um, there's a way to learn logic where you, it's just like learning the rules to a board game. You just learn the rules, follow the rules, do your calculations, and you can get the correct answer. And I want you to have that kind of competency during this unit. I'm going to try to help you get there. But I also want you to know what you're doing. Maybe you've had the experience of like learning how to do a math problem or how to pass an exam. But afterward, you're like, I don't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> um, but you're still able to do it and get the correct answer. I'm going to try to be, now and as we go forward, trying to explain what's going on so that you aren't just competent at getting the right answer, but you know what is being represented. What the truth table is representing is under which conditions would this be a true statement or a false statement, like a true claim or a false claim. If S wedge C really just means at least one of these two components is true, 
then we can look under different circumstances to see if that's happening. Is that happening here in possibility two? Yep. At least one of them is true. That's happening. How about in the third case? Yep, at least one of them is true. C is true. There we go. How about in the fourth case? No, that's not happening. It isn't the case that at least one of them is true. So this statement is making a false claim. Um, it's even more straightforward here at the next two ones that we have to analyze. Um, we've got this claim here. Colonel Mustard's not the murderer. If Colonel Mustard is the murderer, if it's true that he is the murderer, then to deny that is to say something false. If it's false that Colonel Mustard is the murderer, then to deny that Colonel Mustard is the murderer would be to say something true. You see the pattern here? If you've got a negation, this not something, Whatever is the truth value of the thing being negated is just flipped from true to false or false to true. If I say something false, if I deny something false, then I'm saying something true. If I'm denying something true, then I'm saying something false. Again, I will be talking about this a lot more. Sometimes when you're first hearing logic talked through like I'm doing right now, it's like, blah, 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 what, what? What just happened? <laughs> There's lots of double negatives in logic, so get ready for that, or you're already suffering it maybe. Um, but we'll we'll talk through this all more slowly. I'm just I uh, wanted to give you this demonstration here today. Um, I mean, the most basic thing here is if someone is claiming that Miss Scarlet is the murderer, that's only a true statement if it's true that Miss Scarlet is the murderer. So I'm I'm just able to copy over this tr truth. Uh, column right here, this column of truth values here, right over here. There shouldn't be any difference. But you can see how once we start throwing some logical operators in to make things more complicated, that will affect the conditions under which a statement is true or false. It'll, it'll there'll be different patterns here. And we'll be learning all of those patterns and figuring out, you know, uh, how does or work, how does not work, how does and work, how does if then work, and how does if and only if work. We'll be working on all that um, in detail as we go forward here. Here, I want to just kind of move this over a little bit. Um, Neil, are things still going okay for you? Have any questions been popping up? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, when I'm evaluating this claim here, the not C claim, I don't care about S. S is not a part of this, right? If I want to figure out how the negation is modifying C, I just need to know what's going on with C. Correct, because it would be, in under these circumstances, it's false that he is the murderer. Yeah. Cool. Okay. <clears throat> so what have we done here? What we have done is show under what possible conditions do these statements come out true or false. Let me say that again. The truth table is showing us under what conditions, this stuff over here, under what conditions do these claims come out true or false? There's three scenarios in which claim three up here, Miss Scarlet or Colonel Mustard is a murderer. There's three cases under which that would be a true statement. Three cases that are compatible with the truth of that claim. There's two cases here for how this one is true and two cases here, but they're different cases. So under which cases is this a true statement? Under which cases is this a true statement? This is so awesome and useful because of the next step of what we're trying to accomplish here. Step number three. This is where we evaluate for validity. And it is the whole reason why we're doing this. Let me, I'm trying to make this as aesthetically pleasing as possible. 
Um, remember what we are asking when we're asking if an argument is valid or invalid. We're wondering, is it possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false at the same time? Well, we've covered the entire range of the universe of possibilities with our four rows of our column here. One, two, three, and four correspond with these four quadrants of all of the possibilities that could ever exist logically. So <clears throat> we've covered all of our bases. Here's all the possibilities. Is there a possible combination of, of circumstances in which this premise comes out true, this premise comes out true, and this conclusion comes out false? Does that ever happen? Does that ever happen? And because we can see all the possibilities, there's no possibility we've left out. Every possibility has been covered. We've covered all of our bases here. Um, can we? Do we ever see a case where all the premises are true and the conclusion false? Neil? No. Not at all. That's right. In the first quadrant of possibilities here, we have a false uh, premise and we have a true conclusion. That's not fitting the recipe that we need for a counterexample. Um, in the second quadrant, they're all true. So we have all true premises, but not a false conclusion. Over here, uh, we have a false conclusion, but there's a premise that's false. So that doesn't fit the formula for a counterexample for validity either. And the same thing's happening with four. False conclusion, but not all the premises are true. So what has happened? We have, if we ask the question, is there a counterexample? The answer is no. Nope. And because there is no counterexample, that means the argument is valid. And that's what we thought intuitively at the beginning, but now we can demonstrate that that's true. There's no possibility that we left out of our analysis. We've covered all the bases, and we've shown that in every possible combination of circumstances or facts, there's no counterexample that could ever be in principle created. So now when we say the argument is valid, we can really mean it. Now we know for surezies that it is definitely valid. And thanks to the fact that we showed that it was valid in virtue of the form, it doesn't matter what S and C stand for. If we ditch this universe of discourse and have S stand for, I don't know, Star Trek is the best television show that's ever been made, the argument is still valid. That's awesome. That's really cool. That we can, we can see a pattern of reasoning that works every time it's used, no matter what the content is. That's pretty helpful. Um, that empowers you as a critical thinker to be able to evaluate arguments even when you don't know about the subject matter that's being talked about. You can at least confirm that the support relation is solid in the sense of being valid. Now there's some arguments this isn't going to work for and we're going to get into those complexities later when we talk about induction. But that doesn't, that shouldn't take anything away from the power and usefulness of this kind of analysis. Um, it is very, very helpful. It's really cool. Um, so I think this is as far as I want to go today. Um, I don't want to get into any more of the nitty-gritty details of this, but you hopefully have been able to see a broad overview here of everything we're going to be doing with logic. Logic goes further than this. There's some even cooler things that you can do other than just running truth tables to tell if arguments are valid or not. Um, but this is, this is as far as we're going to get in our crash course. We're going to want to learn how to take arguments from English and turn them into symbols and then be able to construct truth tables and know how to calculate truth values um, for complex expressions based on their component parts and an understanding of how the logical operators function to affect those outcomes. And then step three, to be able to analyze that truth table to tell if an argument is valid or invalid. This is the extent of the skills that you will be expected to acquire for exam two. Uh, with regard to the chapter 6 material. It's just going to be that stuff. That's it. Now, I, I think that's still a, 
there's a good amount of learning to happen here just to do even that modest accomplishment but um, the, the, there's nothing other there's nothing you're going to see that is not present in this kind of broad overview from the lecture today so um, maybe before I shut it down first I man I should really think of a uh, code word um, Uh, well, we'll just do, um, well, I, I, I talked about Game of Thrones earlier, so we'll just do snow. Snow is the code word for this video lecture today. Um, and I'll ask you, Neil, uh, if there's anything you'd like me to kind of review or that I could clarify a little bit more. Um, again, you're, you're my canary in the coal mine for everyone who's watching this later. So uh, if, there, if there's even anything that you're like, yeah, I think I got this, but why not? I'll ask a question. Anything you'd like to hear me clarify again? I'd be really happy to do it. Just no. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, just from listening to me today during the lecture, uh, was there anything that jumped out to you from this content that um, you're like, yeah, I didn't quite catch what was happening there? I can. I can definitely do that. You're welcome. Happy it worked for you. Okay, then I guess we'll uh, we'll close down shop for today. And and Neil definitely reach out to me to talk about old homework too. Uh, chapter three stuff, chapter five stuff, uh, anything getting it ready for exam one. Um, Definitely look me up, people. I'm here to help. And um, I don't know if I mentioned this. I, some students know about it because I mentioned it to them. But um, I'm I'm on a family vacation this weekend. But I really, 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 really don't want you to uh, think that because that's happening, you can't contact me or you don't want to bother me or anything like that. This is a crucial time for our class. It's summer quarter is always like this um, in, in terms of like things have to happen and keep moving and so I, I'm very prepared emotionally and everything that for this weekend to be available to students to help and and I don't I don't want you putting it off. I mean if you've got time and you've got questions and you're ready to go um, to, to connect with me as, as preparation for the exam do it text me call me I'm I'm considering myself on call this weekend um, so use it use it please 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 do not respect my time and space that <laughs> don't don't respect my personal life I can manage that I'm very happy to make myself available the thing that would be saddest to me my preference would would be I'd be really sad if a student didn't contact me because they didn't want to bother me on a vacation or didn't want to take time away from I'm spending with family or something like that and so didn't get some help that really would have been a benefit um, you're you're a real top priority for me my I care about my students a lot and I um, I will have plenty of time to hang out with my family and have fun with them um, even if I'm doing some phone calls with students over the weekend so Really don't be shy about that. I may even record some uh, videos here uh, to post. Um, I'm definitely going to be uh, putting at least a short video together about the Chapter 3 material still and one about the Chapter 5 material. Um, I've promised those and 
I really encourage people to post on the discussion threads so that I know what you've got questions about or just which homework exercises you'd like to see me talk through a little bit more. Um, but do that. Uh, there's there's still, because I haven't recorded the Chapter 3 one yet, there'd still be time to, to throw something up on that discussion board and I'd catch it. Uh, right before I start the lecture video recording, I'm going to um, take a look at that discussion board and see whatever posts are there. Those are the ones I'll address. Um, so still time to sneak in on Chapter 3 and Chapter 5. Uh, so please do all those things. Um, know I'm here. I do not resent talking to you ever. I love talking to students. I want to help you as much as possible. So I hope you take me up on that. Okay, that'll be it. Good luck, everyone. Lots of stuff going on. And um, I hope you're having a good experience with the class. I don't get to see all your faces. Usually when I'm lecturing on logic or something, I can see people going like, like uh, or something. And I, that's useful to, for me to know. I like to know how people are feeling. And, it, and it's a... It's great. One of the joys of teaching is seeing people go from like, ah, ah, to being like, ah, that's great. So let me know how things are going with you. I, I hope they are well. And if they're not, I would love to know that too. Okay. Good luck. I'll see you around.